at least we relate to chapter four, specifically pages 160 to 170 that deal with this conflict that happens about a generation before the American Revolution, <laughs> known as the Seven Years' War. It's known in America, but it's known by the American colonists as the French and Indian War, the French and Indian War, because the British um, army, along with the colonial, the American colonists, right, their colonial subjects who form militias and fight under the British army, basically, uh, are going to fight against the French, a French army, which is which which ends up sho which shows up in in the Americas, right? But prior to this, there had been French trappers. It was very the French, New France, the French uh, population in Canada and the, this, what's called the Louisiana Territory. Some of you know the Louisiana Purchase. Like, they're basically are along the Mississippi River. Uh, New Orleans is a French city initially, but there were about 15,000 French people from the time that France began to colonize in the Americas in the 17th century up until this point, which is 1754, when this war starts in America, where the war breaks out. There are only about 15,000 French people. They do, they do not populate the Americas the same way the British do. They don't send massive amounts of population, massive amounts of indentured servants, they're not taking. They're not there with the idea we're going to we're going to give people. People are going to get their own land, start farming their own land. They're going to push indigenous people out. There's very there's fewer of uh, French people. They're mostly ma men. They're mostly trappers and stuff. So they end up forming better relations with the generally speaking, generally speaking, better relations with the indigenous population they encounter. Like in the Great Lakes area, the Huron, uh, the Al a lot of Algonquin tri tribes, it's Al Algonquin, uh, the Innu, the uh, school. Uh, it is referred to in chapter four as the middle ground. This is, if you look at those, th these are the countries, the, the blue and the green countries, this is countries that are involved in this conflict. Right? The areas that have that mild, like red highlight are actually where uh, military conflict takes place, where they are actually engaged, like, engaged in combat battles, right? You can see parts of India. This is, this is um, the war where England begins to sort of solidify its control, colonial control over India. In the Americas, in Europe, Right, and actually even in parts of West Africa. Uh, this is a war that begins in 1754, and it, it um, let me just start off with, with in chapter four of Giving Me Liberty, there's a term, a sub, a sub chapter, a section called middle ground. This idea of the middle ground, which is seen as like a place. It's, 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 this middle ground is actually a place around this Great Lakes area where you have French British colonial interests and, and colonial subjects who are living there, right? French trappers and then English colonists, American, they're American by now, because it's, I mean, people, there are, there, at this point, 1754, Jamestown is 150 years old nearly. So you have people who've been born here, right? George Washington, a 21 year old George Washington is going to be the be involved in the, the cause of this, of this war, which is a dispute over that area around the Great Lakes. It's called the Ohio Valley, present day Ohio. Right. The, early on in America, there was the, Eng, England basically claims this territory from France at the end of this war around the Great Lakes. Present day, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, that whole area. And then the Americans get that territory in the revolution. And those are the first states that are new states that are really carved out by the federal government. So that's a, it's kind of an important region. So before but before that, there, there's still this constant is pushing west, basically. Uh, and there's a dispute between France, which occupies parts of this part, like of Canada, all the way down the Mississippi River, and England, which, claim, which claims this territory on the eastern seaboard, but has colonists that are continuing to move west. So you have groups from Virginia and Pennsylvania. If you look at them, you see this map here? The, the, if you look at a lot of maps from the 1760s, 1770s, 1780s, states, colonies within states, basically Virginia, says, okay, we're, we live here, but we're claiming everything, and these lines would just continue to go across the United States. Because there are no, there's no California, there's no Nevada, there's no anything, at least there's indigenous people living there, but as far as they're concerned, eventually we'll just claim all of this, right? So you have people from Virginia and Pennsylvania that move, want to move west into this area that's claimed by France. And so, so uh, there is a conflict at this place called Fort Necessity. This war starts in 1754, in this Ohio Valley area, a 21-year-old George Washington is put in charge of a militia uh, representing this company, though the Ohio company, that's, that's trying to claim this land for Virginia. He, and he ends up attacking this French outpost, this French fort there. 
and he builds his own fort, Fort Necessity. I guess they built it out of necessity because it wasn't a very, if you look at it, it is just basically a circle of logs. It's like they stacked these logs in a circle and you're looking at it like, okay, that's not gonna work. I mean, they ended up getting surrounded and captured basically. Washington is actually captured in the beginning of this war. He's, he's, he leads the militia that is captured by uh, the French and is, is, is really seen as the cause of this war, uh, which, which starts in 1754. War is actually declared in England by, by the British government against France in 1756, right? Two years later. But the, this conflict over this territory uh, is cited as, one, as the main reason. The first, the first cause of, of declaring war that the British government states in their declaration of war is the uh, injustices or the encroachment on territory that the French have committed in North America and the West Indies, right? So in the, in the islands here. But the war ends up spreading into Europe between various European countries, India, all sorts of stuff, right? Involving involving people in you know, different groups in India. And in North America, it involves various Indian nations. You have the Iroquois Confederacy, who are centered mainly in New York, uh, in the New York, like present day New York State area and, and the New York Canadian border, who side, who side predominantly with the British because they see the British moving west as their ability to sort of go into that western area and exert some dominance over the tribes there. But a lot of the Great Lakes tribes, they support the French, right? Um, and yeah. And the idea behind this is called the middle ground, right? This idea of a middle ground where you have um, British and French interests and then various Indian nations. And there's not really, there's no, this is prior to really a situation existing where we see uh, they, you know, in, in, seven, in the 1750s, they don't see how this situation is going to end, right? The Native Americans don't see a situation where their, num their population is going to be depleted from disease, where all these European groups are just going to continue to encroach on their territory, where they're going to be pushed further and further back and, and end up with very little. They have a very, I mean, if you look at the Indian nations now, they have about 54, 53 million acres, square acres of land, which seems like a lot, but they had, I mean, they had three times as much as that as late as 1870, right? I mean, they had, I mean, not like where they, where they own, they didn't consider themselves owners of it, but they lived on it, you know? It's a very, very small amount of what they lived on. But but in 17, in 1754, they see the British, they see these this one group of Europeans who has their interests, and the French is another group. They don't see them as one uniform group of white people, and they don't see themselves as one uniform group of, like, Indians, right? They see we're Ottawa, and those are the Huron, and that's the Iroquois Confederacy over there. And we have interests, and we've been fighting against these people before Europeans even showed up. And so now we're gonna align ourselves with France to fight our enemy, the Iroquois, or our Confederacy, right? And the Iroquois say, well, we're gonna align with the British. So they, they, everyone has their own interests in this conflict. And also this middle ground is basically where, so this ba middle ground is basically, specifically when it comes to the French, since there, were, there weren't a, a lot of people from France who lived in the Americas, they did not, they couldn't just outnumber the Indians the way the British did. They couldn't just ma move massive amounts of people over here and then start pushing them out through disease and, and, and warfare and stuff. So they had to deal, they dealt with the Indians on more equitable terms. If you look at a lot of the de depictions, like art, the paintings and artistic depictions of, of, of New France, of the French and Indian relations, it's very much like on equitable, on equal terms, you know. It, they both, both, both adopt engaging in the customs of the other group, you know, like, British end up winning this war, right? In 1760, they end up occupying Montreal, which is the French capital of New France. Of, basically, it's, it's, it's a city in Canada, right? Mount Royal, Mont Montreal. They occupy it, and then three years later, there's a treaty signed in Paris called the Treaty of Paris, which is gonna be confusing because 20 years later, the American Revolution ends with the Treaty of Paris. They weren't thinking about making it easier for us. They, and, and for some reason, everyone loves to get together in France to, to for peace, like the Treaty of Versailles, treaties in Paris, something about France, I don't know, makes people think of, it's the croissant. Uh, but the, in the early stages of this war, the French and the Indian, the French and Indian, uh, the, the enemies basically of England and their colonial militia are gonna do very well militarily. Up until about, this, in, in America, the conflict goes from 1754 to 1760. It's called the Seven Years of War because of these dates over here. It's very Revolution. This, I mean, a lot, a lot of this is the main. This is really the main military experience that the colo the colonists, the American colonists, will have prior to the revolution, right? Um, and and they're not really looked at as being very disciplined by the British army, like army regulars, right? The, the both the French and the British 
militaries view the colon the British view, the, view their colonial militia allies, and then the French view a lot of the their Indian allies as not being because dis- they're not regular soldiers. They're fight and they're also fighting for their own reasons, right? The different reasons they're they're, they're there, and they also have a, a desire to, when necessary, protect their own homes because they live there, right? If if the if there's there are various Indian nations that are going around attacking frontier settlements. The colonial militia wants to be able to go defend their homes, right? And the British Army doesn't think that way. They're thinking we're here for for the for the reasons that England is here, and if that means your home gets burned down, we don't care because there's a greater military goal, you know. So, so basically, the the French and the Indians are very successful early on, primarily because of a, a lot of it has to do with the relationship that they have that's very equitable, um, and then also f- fighting style, right? The Indian nations fight, and they're they're familiar with the terrain. They fight in what we would describe more as like you're familiar with guerrilla warfare. Warfare, right? What we would call they wouldn't they didn't call it that back then, but what we would call guerrilla warfare. Um, the British Army, the regular British Army, and this the, this this style of fighting the the Indian nations adopt. The colonists observe that and see that and learn from it, and they're going to employ a lot of that in the revolution. Because the British Army, who's seen the British Army from this period of history? Who? Have you ever seen the army? I mean, you look, you look at, think about the military today. What, what do they wear? What, what's the color of the, uh, like, if they go and fight? They wear, like, tan, green, right? Because it looks like plants and stuff, right? They want to, like, blend. They don't want to, these, these, what do what the British wear? Red coats. They're called red coats. Why? Because they wore bright red coats. Right? But, so you have this, 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 pro, this, this war becomes problematic for the French and Indians because, Prior to this war, uh, early on it's, it's successful for them, but before this you had French trappers and a small amount of French people interacting with these in, in Indian nations. And then when, when regular, now, now all of a sudden you have a situation where there are two European armies in North America, right? The British army, like thousands of soldiers, and then the French army, thousands of soldiers. And there's, they have their own style of fighting, which is markedly different, very different from the way that the colonial militias want to fight and definitely different from the way the, the Indians want to fight, right? They stand in open fields, they line up these armies and they march at each other, right? I mean, they have superior numbers and superior firepower, but they wear these bright uniforms. They're not blending into the landscape, you know? Like, the reason that the British English end up winning this war is because they have superior numbers, they have a superior navy, right? So they're able to block, have a naval blockade so that a lot of supplies aren't, aren't able to get into the French. Um, and also because of this, this, this this event called uh, that centers around Fort William Henry. It's this fort in New York. This fort is surrounded by yeah, French, Huron, Algonquin, Innu Indians, uh, and eventually surrenders. This British, the, the inside the fort, they're basically they're surrounded. They have no chance of escaping. They have no chance of defending themselves because they're they're outnumbered, and they're not going to get any reinforcements. So they surrender. And the French, in order to get that surrender quickly, the French general whose name is Montcalm, M O. I can't. M-O-N-T-C-A-L-M. You don't have to know it, but Montcalm. Montcalm. He offers very generous, uh, sur- uh, what are they called? Terms. Very generous terms of surrender, allowing this ar- this British army to leave. Right? They're allowed to leave. They don't have to spend any time in prison. Like normally, you would go spend like a lot of times. They, prisons back then, prisoners of war would be put on a boat, in like Hudson Bay. During the Revolution, if you can see some, there's something on the History Channel about this that is special. But there's this the Revolution. They would put people on boats. They were in Hudson Bay or some some you know river or some lake, and people would just basically sit in a boat, and that was their that was where they were prisoners of war. The problem is there's like rats on boats. There's a lot of diseases on boats. People would end up dying from from disease. Most people in warfare back then died from disease, right? It's like twice as many people. Um, but that that was not that was not going to be forced onto these British soldiers. They were going to be allowed to leave. They just could. They had to agree not to fight, not to participate in 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 this war anymore. Um, yeah, for, for a certain amount of time, I can't remember. There's, there was, there was like a, they basically weren't. There was, there would be a, normally they would be taken prisoner, and there would be a prisoner exchange with French prisoners, but they were basically paroled. They were told, okay, you're not going to be taken actually prisoner, but you have to agree not to fight until an equal number of French prisoners from our side are released, and then you can, you know, it's like the equivalent of being released. It was very generous, right? Very generous term. About 1,800 Indian fighters from these Indian nations, from 40 different nations, right? And they had very different they had very different ideas about why why they were fighting this war, and a lot of them were not under the direct control of this French general, right? And 
a lot of them just didn't understand this sort of the way that you know the European this European concept of conven this idea of conventional war. We still have this issue with conventional war. What is conventional, right? Like if you fly an unmanned, I mean today if you fly an unmanned aircraft, a drone, right? You can you can get a, a basically a remote control plane with nobody on it and fly it over a some wedding in, in Yemen where there's a suspected a suspected terrorist, you know, person associated with and drop a bomb on people and you end up killing people and there's and from some guy pushing a button in Nevada somewhere, right? And that's that's seen as normal. But if you get on a plane and hijack it and you crash into a building or you know stuff you put bombs on your chest and you blow up a bus or something. It's like, what, what exactly is heroic or what is, what, what is conventional or what is terrorism? It's, it's very much a, a subjective thing a lot of the time. In, in the eyes of the French, in the eyes of the British, definitely, violating the terms of this surrender, and they begin to attack these British soldiers as they're leaving the fort, right? Because for them, they're not getting paid. They're promised that when, if they fight alongside the French, and there are 1,800 guys that show up. There are 2,200 British soldiers in the fort. There's 1,800 Indians that show up. And they're the, they're the ones who have who have who catch the scouts for the British Army who are trying to communicate with with different armies. You know they end up they end up basically getting uh, getting a lot of information for the French Army, and providing a lot of manpower. And they lose a, a there's a huge loss of life because they're assault they're they're launching several assaults on this fort over the course of several days. And so these Indian nations lose a lot of, of manpower, and they see their compensation coming in the form of the spoils of war, right? Taking scalps or taking just ammunition and stuff from other from dead soldiers or, or a lot of times they were there there were a lot of kidnappings they were between 1755 and 1765 in this area there were 2000 different like colonists who were uh, about uh, estimated about 2000 abductions kidnappings they would a lot of times indian nations had customs where they would adopt people if they lost family members in co in combat they would adopt they would like we, we would call it kidnapping but they saw it as sort of adopting of other of, of different people as a way of reclaiming the dead family member they lost and so you have this example where 2,000 colonists are basically like abducted but the their recollection of that of that of being cap captor, of being captured is very not is not what we would associate with traditionally with like kidnapping right because they're sort of taken in a very hostile way but then a lot of them are treated like brought into these tribes and treated like family members and, it's, and so it's, they don't have this ne t entirely negative view of it. It's very, it's very complicated. Yeah, so th so this, the problem with this is you have the situation where the, French, where the Indian nations see fair compensation for fighting being taken away from them, right? They're basically seeing these two European countries coming to terms and they say, wait a minute, we're, we lost all these fighters. We're supposed to get, we're, how are we supposed to get paid? Like we're leaving our homes to fight with you guys and we're getting killed out here and we're not getting anything in return. You're, you're, you're not respecting our end of, they're not being treated as equals basically. They're, they're seeing themselves being pushed aside so that these two European armies can do whatever is normal to them, but it's sort of at the expense of these Indian nations. So they end up attacking these uh, British soldiers as they leave the fort. It's described as a massacre. It really wasn't a ma necessarily a massacre. It was sort of a, sort of a, a skirmish. Read this. Let me read a couple of quotes. This is actually from a book by a guy named Richard White. Um, so he says, the French commander, General Montcalm, the British denounced him for, for permitting the Indians to slaughter prisoners at Fort William Henry, an event James Fenimore Cooper later immortalized in Last of the Mohicans. We're going to watch a bit of that. But of more immediate concern to the French was the price of the efforts Montcalm did make to control his allies. Montcalm's relations with the, the French relations with the Iroquois and Algonquin had become so bad that the French governor accused the general of wrecking the alliance. The French governor, by, by the way, the, the, whoever was governor of New France, whoever was appointed by France, was referred to by a lot of these tribes, these Indian nations, as uh, Anoncho, O-N-T-O-N-T-I-O, Anoncho, which meant like father. They would refer to him as a father. They would, you know, a lot of times they, they would use an, an indigenous word to describe this person, and they would, you know, so they, would, they, they had a relationship that was that strong at times, where they were actually describing these, this leader of New France as like some sort of great father figure or, or you know, person that they would, they would turn to for help or whatever. Um, at the peak of military success, the alliance. This so this is the, this is basically the French and the Indian and their Indian allies had been kicking, for lack of a better term, kicking a lot of ass for like a couple of years. Uh, and their but their alliance began to unravel with the British blockade in effect. Right, the pres presence in trade goods. Anoncho, the, the the governor of France, owed his children disappeared. Right, so not they're not allowed to basically take anything to pay themselves in this in this fort. And even if the French army had was promised them, look, we'll give you, we'll, we'll, we'll compensate you for whatever you couldn't get out of this, out of this battle. 
they couldn't do that anymore because there was a naval blockade. They couldn't bring goods in to, to provide, you know, it's basically to pay, to pay these, so they're Indians who are soldiers, who are offering to be soldiers for them. And they're not getting paid. And then also there were smallpox epidemics that, that ravaged Indians, right? Because you have all these armies that people coming from Europe, and so bringing fresh, you know, fresh sets of diseases and stuff. So it ends up infecting the Indians. Uh, they're pissed off about this fort situation. Once more, the warriors became disgruntled and alienated, and this alliance fell apart. Basically, the, these Indian allies to the French went home, right? So this, this and this is a very important group. They provided a lot of numbers. They had a lot of knowledge of the area, and they did, were willing to do a lot of the fighting. And they basically just became d disaffected and went home a lot of the time. Or did, were not as didn't participate as much. So the French end up losing this war, right? So the French lose this war, and the Treaty of Paris in 1763 and as a result the French lose all uh, basically all their colonial claims the territory they claimed in North America Canada the Louisiana the Louisiana territory right you guess who's familiar with the Louisiana purchase they, they lose almost all of their colonial claims to the in the in the Americas in the Western Hemisphere the exception of being Haiti and French Guiana in, in South America right and Haiti yeah so uh, a lot of you are probably, so the Louisiana Territory that, because the United States, the Louisiana Purchase is what? Is that Thomas Jefferson as president buys the Louisiana Territory from, from who? Do you remember? Who remembers high school? Napoleon. Yeah, Napoleon from France, right? So, they, which, so, but the French actually lose that territory in this war and it goes to Spain. As a result of this treaty, the British win this war and force the France to accept, force, force the France, force the French to accept terms where they surrender all their colonial claims. They lose the Louisiana territory and Spain gets it. Spain ends up, ends up few, later on selling it back to France. And so that's how the French, and then the French uh, are in, led by this guy named Napoleon who really liked to fight a lot of wars. And so he ended up needing a lot of money because wars are, wars are expensive. And so he sold the Louisiana territory to us. Do you know how much we paid for that, this whole section? It's like a third of our country. Do you know how much we paid for it? $15 million, yeah, $15 million, bam. That's like three houses in San Jose now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So the Treaty of Paris is signed. Uh, this is what happens. The, the important thing that this war, relate, as far as it relates to this class, obviously it's a war fought on, on present day, you know, what, what is the present day United States. A lot of these, the results of this war, how this, the, the things that happen after this war, as a result of this war, uh, lead to the American Revolution in a few ways, right? So this treaty, the treaty officially ended fighting, gave Britain all of the land east of the Mississippi River, formerly claimed by the French. The ink on the treaty was barely dry when a new insurgence arose in British-occupied North America. Native Americans, dissatisfied after the war with their position as conquered people and not as allies, a lot of these folks, right? The Iroquois who are here, mostly aligned with the British, but these folks are very fearful of the encroachment of settlers, of colonial settlers, and of the British. And so they basically have an uh, uprising. Uh, yeah, the Native Americans dissatisfied after the war with their position as conquered people rebelled collectively against British colonists and forts along the frontier. Before the war had started, the French had, the French had traded and lived among the Native Americans, but perhaps most importantly, they had given them presence to show respect and diplomacy. Native Americans had grown accustomed to this act of friendliness, and when Britain, the debt in debt after the in debt after the war, right, England's in debt after this war, wanted to considerably reduce the number of gifts given, there were severe consequences. In 1763, Native Americans led an insurgence commonly Pontiac's Rebellion, right? Pontiac's Rebellion. Uh, Pontiac is an Ottawa leader. This insurgence would culminate in the first extensive multi-tribal, he says multi-tribal, what's known, this is the first, one of the first big examples of what's called pan-Indian, a pan-Indian alliance. All tribes, basically all these, all, various tribes with various languages and various mo uh, motives, but, and li various forms of, of like, you know, how they live and how they organize in themselves and, but seeing themselves as one collective group that needs to defend their way of, general way of life against the encroachment of Europeans. Right. This is one of the first. This isn't until 1763. So this is this is 150, 200 years after Europeans had begun to, col to colonize the Americas, before there's really a, a major organized attempt by various Indian Indian nations to say, look, we have like a, we need to keep like all of these people from coming over here, because it's a very it's a severe threat to our way of life, you know. But 
Britain's new policies, the Native Americans took ten, 10 of their forts, which led not only to excess in conflict, but to the British exposing smallpox blankets on the Native Americans. They basically began attacking colonial settlements and forts and stuff. As a result of that, in order, because England now has gained massive, a control of a massive amount of territory, all of North America basically, to the, you know, up, in, up until like the, to the Mississippi, where, which then becomes part of Spain. But they control this massive amount of territory, but they, and they have, they have colonial subjects that want to push west, right? They see the, the colonial subjects, the, the, the Americans basically, the Americans who are gonna fight a revolution in about 10 years after this. At the time in 1763, they see, they're very proud to be a part of the British army, right? They are to be subjects of England. They see themselves as, as, as subjects of the most powerful country in Europe that just won this war. But one of the reasons they're also happy is they get to take all this land, right? Remember this, remember this map that we looked at, where is it? This map. Right, all the, this is the way they see things happening. Right, Virginia gets this, Pennsylvania gets that. They are they're seeing this land as it's ours now. Those tribes over there did not support us; they supported the French. We get to take their land as a result. Right, and the British see a massive, con, ma, uh, just a huge problem as a result. Right, they're in debt. They see these Indian nations already pissed off, and they see so they so they declare what's called the Proclamation of uh, Line of 1763. It's a proclamation issued in 1763. It's known as the Proclamation Line, right? If, do you notice this right here? I don't know if you read this. this is, it says lands reserved for the Indians, right? This line here. So basically all this territory that they had just acquired from France as their own colonial territory, they say the colonists cannot, cannot move there, cannot settle there. It's completely prohibited, right? And this is a major point of contention for colonists who see that land as being rightfully theirs because they had just fought in this war with England. So, so basically, similar to, similar to 